Praise the Lord, everyone. Thank you for joining us as, as we, on this Wednesday night, the midweek Bible study as we live stream from the Pentecostal South Lake Church located here in Maryville, Indiana. We're going to start our service with prayer, and Sister Angie will lead us in some worship, then our pastor will be ministering the word this evening. Let's pray for those uh, uh, who are in our congregation who's sick. Brother Mel Mange is in a hospital. Continue to remember him. Sister Lisa did come home from the hospital. Thank the Lord for that. We need to really pray for Sister Mosey and her family at this time that God's will would be done and uh, God would bring comfort to the family. Continue to remember my daughter Lydia also with her feet that God would complete a miracle. And not only these requests, let's pray for that. God just bring a calmness to our great country, that the Lord would just bring peace to our country, and uh, let's pray that God would just continue to protect and bless and be with our first responders and also all the innocent people during this. Let's just pray together right now. Dear God, we love you, Lord, today. Appreciate you, God. We pray right now, God, that your will would be done. Dear Lord, thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to have this Bible study tonight, Lord. Anoint our pastor, Lord, as he teaches and preaches, oh, Lord, from your word. We pray for Sister Mosley, God, her family, God. Be with them right now, God. You know all about every situation in their life. Thank you, Lord, for bringing Sister Lisa home, God. Remember Brother Mel in the hospital, God. Touch him, I pray, Lord. Continue to be with my daughter, I pray, Lord. You know all about every situation, God. You know about every request out there in the homes, God. I pray, Lord, let your will be done, God. God, just move like only you can do, we pray. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Let's worship with Sister Angie Stewart.
glorious day that's going to be. Let's give the Lord some glory and honor and praise right now. Let's lift him up. Let's exalt him. What a day that will be. What a day that will be. How we look forward to it. So grieved for our nation and world tonight. Seems like there's just one catastrophe after another, and it's just uh, devastating, quite, quite frankly. And uh, I'm calling a prayer meeting this coming Saturday evening at 7 o'clock, and I'm asking all of you who are physically able, if you would fast one day between now and Saturday evening at 7, weather permitting, we may have this prayer service out in our parking lot but we're just going to come together and pray for our nation, for the healing of our nation. We want to be repairers of the breach. So, it, but, you know, if the weather is, doesn't allow us to be outside, we have lots of room in here where we can social distance here in the sanctuary as well as in the fellowship hall. So I think we could handle everyone who would want to come to that prayer service. Certainly outside we have all kinds of room, but we have a lot of room in here as well. So. Uh, our nation needs us, and they need our prayers right now. So I trust that uh, you'll make every effort to be here Saturday at 7 o'clock. And then, of course, Sunday morning we'll once again be having church, and we'll be in touch with you in regards to that. God bless you at home. You may be seated if you're standing. Probably be talking more than just preaching tonight as this... This is just a topic we need to talk about. But my Bible lesson tonight is titled, when, when God's Love is Challenged. When God's Love is Challenged. Now I'm reading from Luke 21 and verse 25 to begin this study where Jesus said of our day, these days just prior to his return, there shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars and upon the earth distress of nations. Interesting when you look up the original Greek as the word nations comes from the word ethnos. It's not talking about countries. It's talking about, in fact, in Strong's Concordance, the first meaning of that word is a race, a race of people. So this is a prophecy in regards to what we see happening in our world right now. In, and upon the earth, distress of races with perplexity. And the Greek word translated perplexity means a state of quandary. Webster's says of quandary and perplexity that it is a state of perplexity especially as to what to do. It's a dilemma. And uh, it comes from a root word that means to have no way out, to be at a loss mentally, to be at a loss in regards to what to do. So Jesus said in the days just prior to his coming that upon the earth there would be distress of the races, with perplexity, a quandary, people in a dilemma, having no way out, not knowing what to do, a state of confusion. He went on to say that uh, the sea and the waves, would, which are a type and symbol of people in the scripture, the sea and the waves would be roaring. And the Greek word that was translated roaring comes from a root word that speaks of a loud or confused noise. And it's, it's, I really believe it's just fitly describing the day in which we live. There will be distress of races. This, this verse could have actually been translated this way. There shall be distress of races who are in, a, are in a dilemma, seeming to have no way out, at a loss. The sea and the waves roaring, people filled with confusion. And here Jesus was, as I said, talking about our day. He then went on to say, men's hearts failing them for fear. 
apt description of our day and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth. We used to think we knew what that meant, but we really didn't begin to have a clue of how this was really going to unfold. Men's hearts failing them for fear and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth for the powers of heaven shall be shaken. And two verses later, Jesus said, when these things begin to come to pass, then look up and lift up your heads for your redemption draweth nigh. Jesus also spoke along these lines in Matthew 24, again, when he was making reference to these days, just prior to his return. And he said in verse 6, you shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass. Sad to say, Jesus said they must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation shall rise against nation. And just a reading in the English version, you'd, you'd really miss the true meaning of it. Because again, that Greek word was ethnos, from which we get the word ethnic or ethnicity. It's talking about a race of people. Race shall rise against race, and kingdom against kingdom. I always said before, that's the one that's talking about the country being against the country, but uh, as I look into this, I, I, don't, I no longer think that's true. It's not talking about countries being against countries but he's talking about spiritual kingdoms that are coming against one another. For nation shall rise against nation or race against race, kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines and pestilences. So the same verse that warned us of the pandemic also told us of the racial difficulties that we're having in our world today. Earthquakes in diverse places, all these are the beginning, not going to get any better. All these are the beginning of sorrows. Jesus said, continued to say a few verses later, and then shall many be offended. An apt description of our day. Shall betray one another and shall hate one another. So it, nearly every time that this word that was translated kingdom Nearly every time that this Greek word was used in the New Testament, perhaps every time, I looked at many of the, the instances, it was in there about 200 times. Every one that I saw was talking either about one of two kings. It wasn't talking about a country. Now, in the Old Testament, that word was used in regards to kingdoms of Old Testament kings. But in the New Testament, every time this word was used, kingdom, from this Greek word basilia, it was used, it was either speaking of God's kingdom or the devil's. There may be an instance or two where it wasn't, but I didn't see them in all the references I looked at, and I looked at many. So for instance, Revelation 12, 10, and I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, now has come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God. It's that same word. And then in 16, 10 of Revelation, the fifth angel poured out his vial upon the seat of the beast and his kingdom. Same, same word, and that's how it's used consistently. Always, if, if not nearly always, his kingdom was full of darkness and they gnawed their tongues for pain. So when Jesus talked about kingdom coming against kingdom, I fully believe that he was talking about the spiritual warfare between God's kingdom and the kingdom of the adversary. And when race comes against race, Jesus linked those two together there in that verse. Okay, we got kicked off our apologies for a little bit, so I'm not exactly certain where that we got uh, disconnected from Facebook, but we're back on. But I'll read Matthew 24, 7 once again. For nation shall rise against nation, and the Greek word is ethnos, meaning race shall rise against race, kingdom against kingdom. And that word translated kingdom is a realm, R-E-A-L-M. There shall be famines and pestilences, et cetera. So as I said, nearly every time, if not in fact every time, that this word that was translated, this Greek word that was translated kingdom 
was used in the New Testament was either speaking of God's kingdom or the devil's kingdom. So when Jesus talked about kingdom coming against kingdom, he wasn't talking about country against country, but rather he was talking about the spiritual warfare between God's kingdom and the kingdom of the adversary. And when race comes against race, then it's actually the kingdom of darkness acting out through human flesh. So this racial strife we see in our world today is actually a battle between spiritual kingdoms, not actually between races of people. That's where the enemy has duped so many. For it's as Paul said in Ephesians 6 and 12, we wrestle not against flesh and blood. This racial battle is not at its core between people. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. And then Jesus continued in Matthew 24, and this is where I got my title from, When God's Love is Challenged, by saying in verse 12, because iniquity shall abound. And I've come to, to believe he wasn't just talking about the general iniquity in the world, but I think he was zeroing in on a particular period of time, perhaps this racial strife period of time. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many as a result of what's happening in the world. And the agape word, the word for love there is agape. We're talking about the love of God. So he's not talking about just the natural love of a human being, but the love of God in his church. So he's talking about the love of the people within his church shall wax cold because of what's going on in the world. In other words, some of the things that will happen during this time of strife will tend to anger us. Is it upsetting? I mean, when we watch a man die unnecessarily at the hands of a policeman, especially when several black men have died that way. Is that upsetting? Of course it is. And all of us were appalled as we watched uh, that man there struggling for his breath. But then is it also upsetting when we see looters and rioters, and I'm not talking about peaceful protesters, but looters and, 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 and thugs that take advantage of a tragedy like this and plunder and steal and destroy and in some case, cases even kill innocent people who sometimes were just trying to protect their property. Is that upsetting? Of course it is. And so it's okay to acknowledge, even with righteous indignation, that these things are terribly wrong. I would hope that we would be able to acknowledge that and say these things are terribly wrong, and that's okay. And it's even to be expected. But then, when that happens, church, it becomes easy for us to switch from our Holy Ghost mode back into a fleshly, carnal mode and to respond to what's happening in our world in the same way that the world itself responds to it. And I believe that's exactly what Jesus was anticipating. He's just finished talking about the strife, the racial strife. He started talking about the spiritual warfare. He talked about the pandemics and all that. So when he said, because iniquity shall abound, and perhaps a time like this, when there's such strife and turmoil in our country and throughout our world, I believe that's exactly what Jesus was anticipating when he said, because iniquity shall abound, and, and things are happening that anger us because iniquity shall abound. The love of many, the agape love of many, so wax cold. And white or black, when we respond to the iniquitous acts that we now see taking place in our world, when we respond in the same way that the world does, we then lose our ability to be a cure for that iniquity. We lose our ability to be a help to those who are confused and, and as the text said, roaring and fearful and all of those things. If we just respond in, in anger, of course we do initially, but if we continue to respond that way, then rather, get down on our, rather than getting down on our knees and 
praying through to the agape love of God once again, then we can't help people if that's where we are. Martin Luther King stated that darkness cannot drive out darkness, and he was right. He went on to say only light can do that. And then he said, hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. And he, of course, was absolutely right. When man was created, he was not created to hate. He was created to love. For the Bible tells us that he was made in the image of God. Mankind was made in the image of God whom John said in his first epistle, who himself is love. God is love. So that's, that's the image. We were created to love like God loves. We were created to love like Jesus exampled for us throughout the Gospels. So if God is love and man was made in his image, that means that we were created to that end and for that purpose. And man did. Adam did. Eve did. They did love until the day when that evil, hateful creature that did not possess the love of God came into the garden and this Satan-possessed serpent was full of the direct opposite of agape love. For he was saturated. He was the epitome of hatred. Hatred for God and hatred for anyone and anything that God had created. So when Adam sinned, it changed the whole scheme of things here on this planet. For when he sinned, he cast aside that loving image and took upon himself the hateful image unfortunately, of our adversary. He was no longer capable of loving with the agape love of God. He was no longer capable of loving like God loves. And now, as a result of that, all of us descendants of Adam have been created not in God's loving image, but rather in the fallen, hate-filled image of Adam himself. All of us descendants of Adam have now been born not with the Lord's loving nature, unfortunately, but rather with Adam's fallen nature. And it's just too easy for us to dislike and to hate and to be angry and uh, even to be a racist. That agape love that originally dwelt in Adam has now been replaced with distrust, hatred, and often racism. And it's just in man as a result of sin. Galatians 5.19 says, Thou the works of the flesh, this is man that's not saved, the works of the flesh are manifest, are they ever in our world right now? The wor works of the flesh are being manifest, which are these. And then verse 20 of Galatians 5 lists several of them, but right in the middle of the pack was this word hatred. The works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. And one of those words was hatred. That's just, it's just there. It's just innate within fallen man. But then just a few verses later, this passage of Scripture goes on to say, but the fruit of the Spirit, the fruit of the Holy Spirit is love. Agape love. So just as something happened to Adam's loving nature when he fell in sin, something likewise happens to us, church. Something happens to our hate-filled nature when we're born again. For it says Ezekiel prophesied, saying, A new heart also, the Lord said, will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you. I will take away the stony heart, he prophesied. I will take away the hard heart. I will take away the stony heart, meaning the, the selfish, unloving, enmity-ridden heart out of your flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh, meaning God's promise was, I'm going to take away your hard heart, and I'm going to give you a tender and agape-loving heart. So God's plan of salvation, church, serves another purpose other than just getting us to heaven and helping us to avoid hell. For the greater purpose of the new birth of water and spirit is to restore something vital 
to this earth, something that it lost through the fall of man. For this world lost something vital through sin that would have prevented all of the wars that have ever been fought, something that would have stopped all of the racial strife. There would be no difficulty anywhere in this, on this planet right now, certainly in our inner cities or, or no place in this country or this world. All of the racial strife w- would never have existed had we not lost this vital thing. All of the bloodshed in our world today would never have happened. For this world lost something that would have kept all of the hatred that we see in our world today from ever entering our hearts, something that would have kept all of the murders, all of the stealing, all of the violence, and all of the other works of man's hate-filled nature from ever happening. Romans 13, 8, for he that loves another has fulfilled the law. For this thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not lie, thou shalt not covet, and if there be any other commandment, and in fact there are 2,713 in the word, it is briefly comprehended or can be summarized in this, in this saying, namely, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. So none of this would be going on. Love works no ill to his neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. So, so this is what the new birth experience is meant to do for us. It, it's meant to restore mankind to that image in which he was first created. Romans 8, 29, God predestinated his church, his New Testament church, to be conformed to the image of his son. That's the image that Adam was originally created in. But now God predestined us not to go along with the anger, and, but he predestined us to be different from all of that. He predestined us to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. How many would just love to be like Jesus? You want to be like Jesus. Let's lift our hands to that end right now. I want to be like him. And I can be because he predestinated me to be. So Christ Jesus came to this earth as the last Adam to restore to this planet that awesome agape love that had totally vanished when Adam sinned. When Jesus came to this earth, he had absolutely no enmity, no hatred, no bitterness. He wasn't a racist. His disciples couldn't believe he was talking to the Samaritan woman at the well. What's he doing talking to her? No racism, no envy, no selfishness within him. For he came to this earth as the very image of our great God who himself is love. Let's praise him right now. Let's give him some glory right now. Jesus is the answer for the world. Jesus is the answer. Hebrews 1.3 tells us that he, Jesus, by himself purged our sins. And when the scripture uh, speaks about Jesus purging our sins, it's talking not just about the sinful actions that we commit, but also the hateful motivation behind those actions. Ephesians 2.15 tells us that Jesus abolished in his flesh the enmity, the hatred. I love that. That means because Jesus overcame hatred in the flesh, he never yielded to hatred. He, he abolished in his flesh the enmity. That means you and I no longer have to be involved in all of that business. Verse 16, so that he might reconcile both. Now he's talking here about the Jews and the Gentiles that he might reconcile, but he could well be speaking about the blacks and the whites and Hispanics or, or any other of, of the wonderful people in this world so that he might reconcile, so that he might do away with racism, so that he might reconcile both the Jews, the Gentiles, the blacks, the whites, etc., you and me, unto God by in one body 
by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby. I believe it's in Galatians where, where it says, you know, there's neither Jew nor Gentile. Then in Colossians, it talks about us being, when we're saved, we're, we're Abraham's seed. There's not, neither male nor female. So, you know, in the church, we can't get involved in any male chauvinist activity or, or extreme feminist activity because, you know, we're just God's children and we love everybody. Somebody said amen. So that he might reconcile both the Jew, the Gentiles, and all the rest of us unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby. He nailed it to his cross. He nailed racism to his cross. So according to this scripture, Jesus destroyed the hatred in all of its, all of its uh, various forms, racism being among them. He slew it. He killed it when he died on the cross. At Calvary, my lovely Savior abolished that hatred that had plagued man, that, uh, that hatred that's at the root, really, of all sin. And he did it in his flesh. And now his spirit dwells in you, church family, and in me. So that gives us all hope. For by this, his spirit in us, and by his overcoming hatred in the flesh, he showed us that we too, by his indwelling Holy Spirit, can now be free from that hate, that bitterness, that anger, that racism with which we were originally born. Jesus showed us that it is once again possible, thank God, to be a human being and yet not hate, not be bitter, but rather to live our lives loving like Jesus loves. If you'd like to do that, lift your hands to him and surrender right now. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, let the love of God be shed abroad in our hearts by your Holy Spirit, Lord. So God wanted us to understand that the very same agape love that Jesus Christ manifested while he was in human flesh is now to be openly manifested in our human flesh. So we can't respond to everything the way that the world does. For the human flesh that his love is now to dwell in is yours and mine because now we are the earthly body of Christ. We have to be fitting examples of his very presence on this earth. For John said in 1 John four seventeen, as he is, as Jesus is, so are we in this world. Wow. I love that scripture. As he is, this is our potential in Christ Jesus. As he is, so are we in this world. We all know John 3.16, but this is 1 John 3.16. Hereby perceive we the love of God because he laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. Somebody praise him with me right now. Give him glory. Hereby perceive we the love of God because he laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down by that same Holy Spirit. We ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. So that agape love that was the motivation behind Calvary is the very same love that is now to be flowing through my human flesh and through your human flesh. For as he is, so are we now in this world. So the Lord has left us here on this earth for one reason and one reason only, so that he can still have some human vessels, amen, that his, that his agape love can freely flow through to the hurting people of this world. We can't get on the side of anger and be a cure to the hurting people of this world. Those ones that are fearful for their lives, as the scripture says, that they're, they're, they're confused. They, they don't know how to get out of where they are. And it's, it's quite, quite a thing that the Lord has made available to us. Now, as I said earlier, it's okay to acknowledge, even with righteous indignation, 
I've been very upset about some of these things that have happened. It's okay to acknowledge, even with righteous indignation, that these things happening in our world are terribly wrong. I watched uh, Mr. Floyd there on struggling for his breath, and that was terribly wrong. But then we representatives of the kingdom of Jesus Christ that is being opposed by the kingdom of darkness, we representatives of the kingdom of Christ can't join in with the prince of darkness and put additional flames on the fire. For the Lord would have us to go out to this hurting world with the cure, not to add to the ailment, but with the cure for the ailment. And that cure, dear ones, is the love of God that's available to us, the love of God that can be shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost. Would you lift your hand and say, God, baptize us. Baptize us, Lord, in Jesus' name. Baptize us with the love of God. So what would that look like when we go out to the, to the world with the love of God? Go on Facebook and you can see some of these things. Brother and Sister Matthew Kanata, pastor in one of the northern suburbs of Indianapolis, and we know them quite well, wonderful people. He happens to be white, and she happens to be black. And they, along with some others, including brother and sister Brian Lane, we know him from our block party, and he's preached for us several times. So the Kanadas and the Lanes and several others went to the war memorial at the Circle in downtown Indy and gathered people together to pray. And you can watch it on, on Facebook. I mean, they prayed. They prayed. Brother and sister Kanata, he white, she black, joined hands. They prayed. People joined with them. And uh, if you watch the, the video on, on Facebook, you, you'll see people on their knees, weeping, crying out to God, along with the Kanadas and the, the Lanes to, to bring peace to our nation, healing to our nation. And at the close of my message, I'm going to read you something that... Uh, Brother Lane posted about the results of them praying at the circle in Indianapolis. Victor ja uh, ja uh, Jackson, many of you young people have, remember him from preaching at uh, the uh, National Youth Congress. He, he preached also at General Conference and has preached for us at our Mark Conference in Indianapolis. Victor Jackson is a young black evangelist, great, great guy with the United Pentecostal Church International. He was in prayer. God spoke to his heart. He flew from Florida, where he lives, to Minneapolis and went to a place close to where George Floyd was killed and loudly introduced himself and said, you can watch that as well. I've come to pray for you all. I'm, you know, and he introduced, I'm Victor Jackson. He hollered out. I mean, it took courage, really. It took courage to do it because, you know, the atmosphere had been volatile around there. But he said, I've come to pray. We need peace. We need calm. We need to make it through this. You know what he was doing? He was letting the love of God flow through him. He was bringing healing. He was bringing a cure. And uh, he went to that place close to where uh, the man was slain and loudly introduced himself, said, I've come to pray with you. We need God. Brother Jackson said, we need God to help us. And the people gathered near and began to weep and, and to cry with him. And Brother Jackson posted this on Facebook. He said, in the spot where I prayed on Saturday, CNN reported there was a complete change in Minneapolis Saturday evening and Sunday. In, this, in the very spot where he had prayed, they said, it is very peaceful. When we gather together in prayer, it changes the entire atmosphere. The world needs the church. Christians are world changers. And that's why we're here. We're here, we're here for the healing of our country and to give them hope in Jesus Christ. Praise him with me, church, in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. <laughs> oh.
So Jesus said, nation shall rise against nation, meaning race against race, and kingdom against kingdom, spiritual realm against spiritual realm. And he went on to say, all these things are the beginning of sorrows. It's not going to get any better. In fact, Paul told Timothy it's going to wax worse and worse. Two verses later, it's recorded that Jesus said, then shall many be offended. We can't ever be a part of that group. Shall betray one another and shall hate one another. In verse 12, and because iniquity shall abound, things are happening that we think, come on, that's unjust, that's just not right. Things that anger us, and because it abounds, it tends to, to anger us, and we tend to get out of our agape love into the fleshly carnal mode once again. Because iniquity shall abound, the love, the agape love of many shall wax cold, and we'll respond in the same way that the world responds. But, Jesus said, he that shall endure to the end, not going to take that love from, from me. I want to be part of the cure. I want to be part of the repairer of the breach. So, no, you're not going to take it from me. I'm going to keep on loving people. I don't care what color they are. Come on, somebody. I am going to keep loving people in Jesus' name. But he that shall endure to the end and keep loving people, the same shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world, all races. Who's he going to use? He's going to, he's going to use the people that pass the test, the love test that he's putting us through right now to reach this world with the only saving gospel, this gospel of the kingdom. We're in the right kingdom. We're on the winning side. This gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. Somebody clap your hands to God. Give him praise. So Jesus knew and understood. He knows our frame. He knew that some of the things happening in this end time world would tend to anger us. It's very upsetting to watch a man die unnecessarily at the hands of a policeman or anyone else. Very much so. It's also upsetting when we see looters and rioters Again, I'm not talking about peaceful protesters, but looters and thugs that take advantage of a tragedy like this and plunder and steal and destroy, and in some cases even kill. So again, it's okay, we're just human, it's okay to acknowledge, even with righteous indignation, that these things are wrong. These things are terribly wrong, but we can't allow them to, to get us to stop loving people. Jesus loves them. I mean, Jesus was hanging on a cross for our sins. He looked down at the ones that were, were in, in a rage and saying, crucify him. You know what he said by the agape love of God. He said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And just several weeks later, 3,000 of them were added to the church. That's what he wants to do. Some of these people that are, rooting, uh, that, that are doing some of these, some of the policemen, some of the, the, the people that are rioting, Jesus is going to save these people. If you believe that, clap your hands to the Lord. He loves them, and he's going to fill them with the agape love of God. Somebody said amen. That we have to be careful because when that happens, if we lose the love of God, it becomes easy for us to switch, and we get angry, and we hold on to that bitterness. It's easy to switch from our Holy Ghost agape love mode back into a fleshly carnal mode and to respond to what's happening in our world in the same ugly way that the world does. And so I believe that's exactly what Jesus was anticipating when he warned us of this time, pandemic, catastrophe, following catastrophe, pandemic, and now racial strife. And he said, because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. God's New Testament church cannot allow that to happen. So let me go so far as to say I fully believe that that's what Satan hopes to, to accomplish through this. And that could very well even be his main target. Is God's New Testament church because he knows that without maintaining the agape love of God, 
the church of Jesus Christ will fail at its mission. If he can get us looking at things in the same way the world does, rather than in loving compassion with the cure, he knows that he can cause us to fail at our mission. You have to love people to fulfill this mission, even people that aren't lovable. And somebody said amen. Because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. But he that shall endure to the end, the same shall be saved. This gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world, among all races, by those who refuse to give up their love for their fellow man. And somebody said, that's me. By the Holy Ghost, that's me. So what's going on in our world today, I fully believe, is a necessary step in God's plan for us. I mean, he foretold it. There it is. Luke 21, there it is. Matthew 24. So it's, it's a necessary step in God's end time plan. It's a necessary step in God's end time plan for us in that through this, he can test us and see if we'll continue to love people with the love of Jesus or if we'll allow our love to wax cold because we're just so angry of what's going on that we allow it to get into our spirit. But listen to this verse. I, I, I saw it differently today than I've seen it before. Jesus said this, by this shall all men know that you're my disciples if you have love one to another. I always kind of wondered why that verse didn't say, although it does say this in other places, why that verse didn't say, they'll know that you're my disciples because you love them. But this verse didn't say that. Jesus said, all men will know that you're my disciples if you have love one to another. You love your brothers, you love your sisters, because despite the fact that we're white, we're black, we're Hispanic, we're Oriental, or whatever else makes no difference, they'll know that we're his disciples because no matter what, there's no racism. No racism here. Colorblind here. We love one another. And they're going to, in a, in, a, in a world that's filled with racial strife, that's going to attract people that know better than that, people that want to love everybody. And they know that we're just all human beings. That's going to attract them. That's going to draw them. By this shall all men know. Hey, these people, they love you. They don't care. They're not racist. They're going to love you no matter what, what color you are, no matter what race you are. Come on, let's ask God to baptize us with the love of God. In Jesus' name. And then I also fully believe that all of this trouble is also a necessary step to get the people of this world to a place where they come to realize their need of God. And God foresaw all of this from the beginning, saying that upon the earth there will be distress of races with perplexity, not knowing what to do, frustration. I know it seems, you know, to the black people that just that they're being really picked out and, 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 and not getting the fair shake that perhaps they would get if their skin was another color. So they're confused. They don't know how to get out of that. And so it, sometimes steps are being taken that perhaps they wouldn't want to take. The seas and the waves roaring, it's confusion. They said, we don't know what to do. We, we just know something needs to be done. Something needs to happen. So distress of races, wondering what on earth they can do. Men's hearts failing them for fear and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth. For the powers of heaven shall be shaken. And Jesus said, when these things begin to come to pass, then look up. Lift up your heads, for your redemption draweth nigh. So I don't think it's just the church is going to be lifting up their heads, according to those, that portion of Scripture, because men's hearts are going to be failing them. They're going to be looking for an answer. They're going to be looking for a solution. And when these things begin to come to pass, that is a necessary step to the revival, Brother Noel, that God has promised his church. They have to start looking. There has to be an answer. There has to be a solution. And then that's when the Lord's going to allow his light to arise upon his church. And he's going to say, those people love each other. Maybe, maybe they'll love me too. And somebody said amen. I want to close with this. Second Chronicles seven fourteen. If my people which are called by my name, the Lord said. That's us. Shall humble themselves 
and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. You know what I noticed about Daniel when he prayed? I think it was in Daniel 9, early part of the chapter when he prayed. He didn't just repent for himself. He repented for his nation. And I just think that would be a wonderful thing when we gather here on Saturday evening if we would repent, not just for ourselves, but people in our world really are, are caught in a trap. So many of them are in a place where they don't want to be, but they don't know how to get out of it. And we know about repentance. And we can stand in the gap for them. And we can pray for them. Say, God, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. They don't understand how they got in this mess. So, Lord, we are repenting not only for ourselves, but we're, we're repenting for our nation. And he said, if my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray, seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. Church, we hold the key to the healing of this nation. So we have to let our light shine. We can't let our anger and our frustration overwhelm us to the extent that, that uh, we lose that edge, that needed edge of the agape love of God. And somebody said amen. And one way I might add in the scripture that people humble themselves, that's why I'm asking that you would fast at least one day if you're physically able between now and Saturday evening because oftentimes in scripture, when we are called to humble ourselves, they did that by fasting. Fasting is a humbling experience. One such place is in Psalm 35, 13, where it says, As for me, when they were sick, my clothing was sackcloth. I humbled my soul with fasting and prayed for them. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to humble our soul. How many want to see our cities healed? How many want to see our inner cities healed? How many want to see these, these people, the black people, the white people, the Hispanic people? How many want to see the people in our nation loving one another, getting along harmoniously? Come on, it's the will of God, and we are the agents that are to make that happen. Amen. We're going to pray for them. We're going to earnestly pray for them, and we're going to fast. For, for God inspired Isaiah to write this. He said, is not this the fast that I have chosen? to loose the bands of wickedness, to undo the heavy burdens, to, set in, uh, to let the oppressed go free, and that you break every yoke, making reference to every evil yoke. Then thou shalt call, the Lord said, and the Lord shall answer. Thou shalt cry, and he, he'll say, here I am. It just helps our, our prayers to be that much more effective. And they shall say of thee, and they that be of thee, shall build the old waste places. Thou shalt raise up the foundations of many generations. Thou shalt be called the repairer of the breach. How many would like to see PSL, our PSL church family, be repairers of the breach here in Northwest Indiana? We want to see it, Indiana. We want to see the racism in Northwest Indiana be healed. We are going to be repairers of the breach, the restorer of paths to dwell in. So I'm asking those of you who are physically able to fast one day between now and Saturday evening and then to meet me and my wife here at the church Saturday at 7 p.m. for earnest prayer for our nation. And our united fasting and prayer will help us to become repairers of the breach. Let me read. Let me tell you something I, I saw this morning. Brother McKinnis pastors one of our churches in South Bend. It's the church that Brother Ballestero used to have. And they have a 6 a.m. prayer out in their parking lot, drive through prayer. There was a woman that decided not to go to work today. She was just so upset about what's going on in our world, like so many. This is just exactly Luke 21, what we were just talking about, that she, just, she was just too upset to even go to work. And God led her. She drove and turned down that street and saw them out there praying and went in there and said, what, what are you doing? And they explained to them that they're praying for the healing of our nation. And uh, she said, that's what I need. And explained that she hadn't gone to work and that she was fearful and confused and didn't know what to do. And they prayed that woman through to the baptism of the Holy Ghost there in that parking lot. Come on, that's what I'm talking about. 
That's what I'm talking about. We have the cure. We are the repairers of the breach. I want to read what uh, Brian Lane, Lane wrote on Forward, which is a minister's uh, forum on, on Facebook for the UPCI preachers. And Brian said, the church is the restraining force of evil in the world. Sunday evening, we prayed in the center of our city, Indianapolis. Today, I had the privilege of having a conversation with the leaders of the Indianapolis Metropolitan Police Department. We discussed everything that took place last night. They asked us to continue to pray for our city. Last night was the most peaceful night in four days. Tonight, police and protesters have been walking arm in arm. Come on, we need to thank God when we see that happening. Police and protesters have been walking arm in arm. Peace is being restored to our city through the efforts of the church. Prayer works, Brother Lane said. The gospel is powerful. This is just the beginning. We are called to be sheep among wolves in the world. The church cannot be absent when the world is in chaos. Hear that, church. The church cannot be absent when the world is in chaos. We are the peacemakers and the repairers of the breach in our city. We love the protesters. We love the police. We love all our community. We love our city. Could we say the same thing? We love the protesters. We love the police. We love all our community. We love our city. We love our region. Let's ask God to help us to be repairers of the breach, church. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. At the conclusion of this Bible lesson, would you just take two or three minutes? I'm going to go over here to my chair and bow for just a few minutes. Would you do that right now? Say, God, we want to love people. We, we, we're, we're distraught ourselves. We see what's happening in this world, and we, we never anticipated this, quite frankly, that it would go this direction. And this isn't the vision we had for 2020, so we're trying to catch our breath. Our heads are spinning, but yet we know that we're here for a purpose. And if you're going to test our love, we want, we want to pass with flying colors. We want to get an A. We want to be baptized with the agape love of God. Would you take, uh, make uh, the initiative right now there at home, dad, mom, Get your family. Would you just bow together here for just a few minutes to say, God, we want to be used of you. We want to be repairers of the breach. As Sister Angie sings here for just a couple minutes, let's get on our knees and let's pray together. Thank you so much.
Thank you so much for joining us tonight via live stream. And please remember, if you're physically able, let's, let's really stand in the gap, humble ourselves, the time of fasting for our nation, certainly for our region. And then let's, uh, let's meet here Saturday evening, plenty of room where we can social distance and still touch the throne of God for the people of our city and for the people of our nation. And then Sunday morning at 10 a.m., we once again, Lord willing, will be meeting here uh, at the church for an in-service um, service. We're looking forward to seeing you at that time once again. We had 12 or 15 more people here this past Sunday than the previous, and we expect it maybe to just keep growing a little bit every week. But we will still have the live stream available for those of you that uh, feel like you need to stay home a little while longer. We love you very much, and uh, let's lay it to heart. Thank you so much. <laughs>